Days at theme parks, while fun, can be filled with all sorts of crowds, stimuli, and anxieties that come with traveling somewhere new or public. So here are my tips and strategies on how to best prepare you or the autistic adventurer in your life for an enjoyable day at a theme park. Salutations adventurers and welcome to Caddy's Adventure Diary. My name is Caddy, I am autistic, and I love theme parks. Now, what are some of the first things that you picture when visiting theme parks? Roller coasters? Fun character encounters? Neat shows? What about being squeezed in massive crowds? Or long waits in claustrophobic lines? How about having constant noise ringing in your ears? Okay, with all seriousness, I know that these issues bother everyone when going to theme parks. Autistic people are not unique in having to deal with problems that anyone has when visiting places designed for massive crowds. Where autistic people are different is that we feel these issues way more intensely than the average visitor. But then, if it is constantly overwhelming for me to deal with large crowds, why am I even choosing to sit down and talk to you about visiting theme parks? Well, over the years, I learned how to best prepare for parks I visit before I even start a trip. And here are the best ways to prepare for theme park trips based on my own experiences. Get ready, adventurers. It's time to prepare for the next adventure. Before I begin any trip, I prepare my adventuring bag. My adventuring bag is basically my special name for this gray backpack that I bring with me on my theme park trips. If you see some older photos of me at theme parks, you might see that I used to use a satchel bag instead. But once I had to start bringing more stuff to make the diary, this was a well needed upgrade. When deciding on an adventuring bag for you or your adventuring party, pick the bag that is both comfortable and practical for you. For instance, if you don't need much more than your phone or wallet, then using your pockets or a small bag would be reasonable. If you need to bring more stuff or know that you want to buy a lot of souvenirs on your trip, then a backpack would be the best bag for you to bring. However, be aware that practicality doesn't just come down to the type of bag you bring, but also what you pack. Keep in mind that when you go to theme parks, you will be walking a lot. Most of the major theme parks are massive and require moving about on your own to get from one land to another. And if your adventuring bag is too heavy, you will feel the consequences of that trip hours down the road. So there is sort of a symbiosis between the bag you pick and the items you bring along on your adventure. And because of that, you need to be a bit choosy about the kind of items you want to bring with you. I personally decide what I'm bringing each day to the park by breaking them down into two categories, utility items and calming items. Utility items are the basic essentials that I need to bring with me whenever I go outside, let alone for a long day at a theme park. This includes stuff like my wallet or my cell phone basically anything that I need when going outside. Obviously, I wouldn't go out grocery shopping without my utility items, so I definitely wouldn't go for an eight hour long trip to Disneyland without them either. Calming items serve a different purpose, keeping me calm while visiting the parks. These items vary on their necessity because their ultimate purpose is to keep me from getting overwhelmed by stimuli at the parks. An essential calming item for me are my earplugs because they help me cancel out any of the loud noises inside of the park. A non-essential calming item for me is my Kindle, because while it is helpful to have something to read while in line, I usually get distracted by queue decorations to read anything. Unlike utility items, calming items vary from one adventurer's needs to another's. Whatever you need to bring with you, bear in mind the weight and bulk of what you are bringing with you. Wallets, phones, and earplugs are all easy things to pack because they're thin and small, but a web power-up band or a massive book can take up a lot of room or make your bag way too heavy to carry around all day. If you know both your carrying limit and what you need from your personal items, then you can pick the right gear and the right bag for your adventure. What you pack isn't the only important personal thing to do before visiting the parks. What you wear matters just as much. First and foremost, I highly recommend comfortable shoes. Whether you are walking around all day or sitting in a wheelchair or stroller for most of your time, you need something comfy on your feet. Most days, I wear these red running shoes because they are made for long distance walking. Plus, they are bright red with white soles, making me feel a lot like Sonic the Hedgehog. 
Depending on the weather, you may need different kinds of shoes. Like when it rains, I wear these Skechers boot sneakers. Not only are they comfy for long distance walking, but they are also waterproof. I have actually bought these while I was spending time with my dad in the UK, and they made walking around York and Glasgow in the middle of winter much more comfortable. Not sponsored, just like these shoes. Beyond shoes, I try to wear clothes that are really comfortable for me. My standard wardrobe consists of comfy sweats, a t-shirt, a jacket, and a hat. If it is a warmer day, I swap the sweats for shorts and pick a lighter jacket. As for colder days, my jacket is usually heavier, and I might wear some nice thermal underwear. Regardless of the weather, I want to make sure that I am not only prepared for the weather of the day, but I also feel cozy as I am walking around the parks. Hats are one of those things that took me a while to get used to. For the longest time, I always felt uncomfortable having something touch my hair, so I avoided wearing any hats when traveling. But then I started needing hats to either keep my head warm during a cold day, or shade my face during a hot day. Plus, I started finding more fun stuff to wear around the parks, including my top hat. <coughs> Subscribe to see the Dapper Day video in April. <coughs> Final things I suggest packing are anything you need for specific weather situations. Umbrellas are helpful on rainy days, but you really need to be careful of the crowds and any wind that could blow your umbrella away. Instead of umbrellas, one item that I see a lot of people using on rainy days are rain ponchos. These go over your clothes and your main jacket just to keep you extra dry on rainy days or on really wet water rides. I actually have a poncho myself. It's one that my parents got at DCA around when it opened. And as you can see, we put it inside of a plastic baggie and squeezed all the air out of it. This made the poncho easy to pack and carry inside of my adventuring bag. Okay, so now that we have gear out of the way, we need to talk about researching the parks before you go. Park research takes a variety of forms from looking up accommodations to learning about the experiences at the parks before you go. But no matter what you research, Researching what is available to you at the parks helps ease any anxiety about what you are doing. True story, and one that I will expand upon in a future video, I actually really like spooky stuff and really wanted to try Halloween Horror Nights at Universal Studios Hollywood, but I knew that by going to Halloween Horror Nights, I would have to deal with tons of flashing lights, scare actors jumping in front of me, and seeing tons of grotesque imagery. But literally a month before I went to the event, I spent hours combing through articles, videos, and more on how to deal with HHN as an autistic person. Sure enough, I had a great time at the event. One major aspect of my research is to watch videos on the attractions I want to experience. Usually I just hop on a YouTube and search for whatever ride I want to go on, and then I try to watch at least two or three videos on the same ride to see if I would enjoy it. Sometimes though, I look at ride reviews or history videos as well to see if there's something that I need to know about that the videos don't quite show. Yes, they will spoil what happens on the rides, but I will take knowing that I may like the ride over worrying about spoilers any day. My favorite channels for ride through videos are Attractions Magazine and SoCal Attractions 360. These channels do an excellent job showing thorough ride through footage with great camera work and beautiful visual quality. Plus, many of their videos show every aspect of a ride from the queue to the exit. Basically, these channels do what I am trying to do on this channel, but with more dedicated video time to the attractions themselves. As for history videos, there are a few that I like. Expedition Theme Park and Theme Park History give really good perspectives on the history of attractions as well as detailed summary of rides both old and new. If you have multiple hours on hand, definitely check out Martin Smith's work on martinsvids.net. His camera work is superb, and he literally gets everything about an attraction down to its smallest detail. Plus, he includes text histories of the rides he reviews on his videos, so that's pretty awesome too. I'll have links to these channels in the description of this video, and they're also available on the Featured Channels tab on my own channel page, so go and check them out. The other part of research is figuring out what accommodations are available to you once you get inside the parks. And I have to be honest here, this step can be tricky to figure out on your own. Now, every theme park has a guest services building where you can learn more about the accommodations available to you once you get inside the park. These buildings are usually located at the front gates of the park and we'll have a big sign to let you know where they are. 
If they are built into the theme of the land, they will usually be made to look like a town hall or a studio office, basically a place you would expect to get help. When I asked a cast member at DCA about accommodations for autistic people, she told me to check out what is on the Disneyland Resort website. So I did what she told me and pulled up the webpage. Well, technically I had to search for the webpage online first before I could read what accommodations were available. That's because Disneyland's main tab to get to the guests with disabilities is all the way at the bottom of the main webpage inside of the help section of the footer. Granted, once you open the webpage, you instantly find all the main pages you need. Cognitive disabilities, disability access service, ECV rentals. But to make things easier for everyone here, I have provided links to these pages and to others in both the description for this video and on my website. I've also provided links for Universal Studios because their disabilities page isn't any less difficult to find. Now the websites can give some solid info on how to prepare for a day at the park. Disney and Universal even have warning guides for autistic people so that potential stimuli are known for each attraction in advance. But sometimes I had a hard time finding exactly what I needed. For example, when I first tried to find Universal Studios Hollywood's main disability page, I found a general FAQ with a PDF guidebook. This confused me as Universal Studios Orlando's site doesn't have the same setup. I was able to find the accessibility information tab at the bottom of both pages, but still, that was a lot of digging to find this information. And once I found the page, I realized that there wasn't a section for cognitive disabilities, unlike Universal Studios Orlando. I have to give thanks to the website Undercover Tourist. They actually wrote an article on Universal's Attractions Accessibility Pass and how it could be applied to autism. Universal Studios and Disneyland have these sort of punch card systems for attraction lines, where if you have a physical or cognitive disability, you get a return time for the attraction you want to ride based on the current wait time. And then instead of waiting in line, you return to the front entrance at your return time and walk right to the front. It isn't necessarily like the Lightning Lane or Universal Express Pass, which have return times or front of the line access. I sort of see it like the original Fast Pass system and it is really helpful for avoiding being crowded in lines. But the thing is, I wouldn't have known that either of these passes existed, nor if they could be applied to autism without reporting from people like Undercover Tourist. And just to make sure you don't have to get as lost as I did, I have links in the description for the individual pages I have mentioned in this video, as well as a link to my main website's disability resources page. I promise to keep updating that list as I visit different parks. Ultimately, what I want to make clear is that by taking the time to research what is available at the parks, you can have a plan. I do occasionally like a nice surprise or a fun random event to happen, but for the most part, I need to know what's going on. I personally need a plan because otherwise I can get anxious about what might happen. And if something doesn't work out, I have a backup plan to try something else. Some theme park apps allow you to make checklist itineraries. These can really help keep track of the stuff you want to do. These itineraries aren't perfect though. I love character meet and greets, but the moments and locations where characters turn up can be inconsistent. Some regular meet and greet spots like the Royal Hall or Meet Mario and Luigi are guaranteed, but other characters are more random, so you really can't add them to the itinerary. This brings me to my final piece of preparation advice and Honestly, it's the hardest one for me. Be prepared for things to not go your way. Anything can happen on these trips, good or bad. But even when you have planned for everything else, the crowds, the weather, the loud noises, the bright lights, surprises on the attractions, you have to simply be prepared for the fact that stuff happens. Now, I don't really have much of a piece of advice for this section, but more about how I changed my attitude on the randomness. Basically, I realized that a day in the park can be much like my mood at any given moment. Sometimes I feel great, like I can take on anything in front of me. Sometimes I get scared and I don't want to do something more once I actually see it. And plenty of times I get tired and just want to go home. Basically, if I could change my mind once at the park, about what I want to do, then I had to accept that situations can change too. Again, this is still something that can be a massive letdown in the moment. But once I have a good backup plan in mind, I can just make sure that I still do something that is fun to me. Ultimately, it's about listening to yourself or the autistic adventurer in your group. 
You need to know your limits. What are you okay with? What are you not okay with? If something doesn't work out, what do you want to do instead? Again, this isn't so much of a solid piece of advice, but more of something to consider practicing before you go on an adventure. When traveling to theme parks as an autistic person, preparation is just as important as going to the park itself. Before every new experience or even every trip, I need to make sure that my bag is packed, my clothes are together, my options are clear, and my mind is prepared for whatever may happen. All of this needs to be done before I even leave the house. But as Douglas Adams said before me, don't panic. When I am going to theme parks, I need to remind myself that I am there to have fun. And even if I don't get to do everything, I can still make the most of my day. Having stuff like the apps can help me plan my day, but I can also take the time to find things for when plans change. And plenty of days, it isn't so much a matter as to when you get attractions done, but what you get done. I personally am happy if I can get at least 70% of my ideal list done in a day. You have to know your limits each day, and you have to learn how to move with the flow. But once you have the tools and techniques you need down for yourself, you may find that these new adventures aren't quite so perilous after all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more tips and tricks and reviews. Links for the stuff I mentioned in this video are once again in the description below, along with my socials and official website, where I have extended blogs and other content. Also, please leave a comment below if you have any questions you want me to answer or any suggestions for future diary entries. Thank you once again, and until the next adventure, remember, when you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Farewell. All right. Hey, Tori. Hi. Um, so I was wondering um, what would be some good show recommendations for autistic people so that they could just, you know, have something they enjoy and still get and not be as like triggered or anything like that. Sure. Uh, well, my personal favorite is the Animation Academy in our building. Uh, what's great about the Academy is they show you step-by-step how to draw different Disney characters. Um, but it's very nice and relaxing and it's a lot of fun to do as well. So it's kind of a good balance between um, a lot of, you know, engagement without having to worry about feeling crowded or feeling like you're not a really loud environment either. And the artists are very helpful when you're getting used to drawing on this time. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Daddy's Adventure Diaries!